owners. Heidi Floor is my business partner. Heidi Floor and I own the River Valley Group, and we are an expansion team with Keller Williams. Um, our hub is in Louisville, Kentucky, which is why I'm able to join this Louisville crew today. So our hub is based out of Louisville, and I worked in your all's market center for many years. And now I find myself in Cincinnati, Ohio, and some of the agents who are on here right now are from Cincinnati. So this is also an opportunity, if you guys so want, if you wanted to do that, to create some referral partnership relationships. We've got agents who are in Louisville, Kentucky, and we have agents who are in Cincinnati, Ohio. So I know there's a lot of people who move back and forth in these areas. So this is a great opportunity for you guys to meet other people in different market centers. And um, that said, we are an expansion team and we are hiring. So I've already cleared it with Amy to make sure I could say this. If you are not currently on a team in Louisville, please know that we are looking for a few agents in Louisville. So if you're interested in joining a team or learning more, you've got my contact information. All right, let's jump in. So today we are talking about contracts and writing contracts. And some of you have been taking these classes for a while now, and I would like to hear right now, what have you guys recently reviewed when it comes to offers, writing offers? Where where are you right now in, in the training that you've done thus far? Um, so for me, I've, I've watched some of the PC videos on offers. I did the offer workshop mm -hmm. um, class, um, and that's kind of where I'm, at and I have my first buyers. So I'm going to be in a situation where I think maybe in the next couple of days, we might be putting an offer in on a house. Okay. And so that's, that will be my first one. Okay. For training wise, I've done the workshop and just watched some videos. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Who else? Where are you guys? I, I'm at the uh, point where I need to be as competitive as I can with my um, buyers and trying to get some pointers to get a leg up okay. on some other agents and trying to get the business when I'm in competition with three or four other people that are writing offers. Absolutely. Absolutely. A lot of us are needing that. And I imagine everyone, no matter where you are, Louisville, Cincinnati, or in between, we're all dealing with those situations um, where we're coming up against multiple offers quite often. So we right. definitely want to be able to stand out. What else? Has anybody else, has everybody, has anybody never written an offer? Is somebody very experienced and you've written uh, 20,000 of them? Where are you guys? All right, fair enough, we'll move on. Okay, so it sounds like I've got agents who are experienced and looking for a leg up, and we have agents who are brand new looking for some direction on the first time. So that's perfect, because this is gonna be good for you guys. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna jump right in. First thing we're gonna be talking about is really reviewing what the steps are in writing our offer. This needs to go. What I need to hear from you guys right now is whether or not you can see my screen. Is that a yes? I can see it. Fantastic. Okay, let's jump right in. So we're going to go into um, a checklist for preparing to write an offer. So we're making the assumption right now that you have the client, right? You have the buyer, you're getting ready to write an offer. What do you need to do in order to be prepared? So we've looked at the house, we've looked at multiple houses, we found the house that we want to write on. So some of the things that we need to make sure that we have when preparing to write an offer, first things first is that pre-approval from the lender. You absolutely have to have the pre-approval from the lender. In a buyer's market, maybe that's not going to be required, but in today's market, a seller's market, you have to have that pre-approval from your lender. Um, I would suggest that you have a go-to lender that you love working with 
And that is your person that you can call no matter what time of day it is, and you can get that pre-approval for your client. The other thing to make sure you're doing when you are talking to that lender to get that pre-approval, and when I say get the pre-approval, yes, your client can forward that information to you, but I think it's best if you introduce yourself to the lender and say, hey, my name's Kristen, I'm representing your clients, Billy and Susie, and we're going to write an offer, and I just wanted to take a moment to introduce myself. I would love to get that pre-approval letter and do my clients need closing costs? The reason why we're asking the lender that is because oftentimes our buyers will say, yes, we need closing costs covered, but they're not exactly sure how much they need. And that lender is going to be able to provide that clarity for you. So make sure you've contacted your lender before your client's lender before you write, introduce yourself and find out what kind of loan they're getting and whether or not they need closing costs. Those closing costs that are going to be covered by the seller. Um, ask them about the interest rate that the, your clients are going to get and the down payment that they're going to uh, use. You're going to need that information for the offer. Um, the next thing you're going to need to do is prepare a CMA. If your clients are writing on a house at 123 Main Street, we need to know that 123 Main Street is worth the amount that it's listed for at least, right? So you need to have that because you need to be able to educate your clients. If you're looking at a house that's listed at 250 and you haven't done your homework and that house is not going to appraise for 250, you can get your clients in a sticky situation. So you need to know that going in. So make sure you do your CMA to prepare uh, your clients as far as confirming that value for them. So we want to educate our clients at all times. Another thing you could do is you could check uh, tax records and see what the current assessed value is. Um, there are locations where the tax assessment is not the most accurate. It's just one more place where we can go to gather information. So looking at those tax records could be very helpful. Plus, it's also confirming how much your client can expect to pay in property taxes. Go ahead and check the MLS. Look at the MLS history for price adjustments, recent sold information, any fallouts. Why would we want to know about fallouts? Do we know what fallouts are? No, what's a fallout? So when the deal falls apart. So it was, let's say the, the property was listed on February 1st and was uh, pending on February 3rd and then went back on the market February 5th. I would want to know why. Your client would want to know why. So we need to look and see whether or not there's been any kind of fallout before. Why would you want to know that information? Well, you're going to want to see if the you can get a better deal on the house, what your what your offer you may want to offer less, if you know something's wrong with the house, if it fell apart during inspections or. Yep. Absolutely. This is this falling apart on inspections is huge. So there's a big difference between the buyer couldn't get financing or something happened or the buyer changed his or her mind versus um it's back on the market due to inspections we need to know what happened um, and if it did fall apart on inspections then you need to do a little more digging what exactly happened would you be willing to share that information with us would you be willing to share the home inspection report that's something that you might be able to get for your client as well okay i'm gonna guys thank you so much for uh, i see on the chat where a couple of you guys are at work and you can't talk totally get it and you can't be on the camera thank you okay so we're going to find that information um, by looking at the mls history and price reductions so we're looking at those two um, go ahead and check your auditor site or your county clerk site for any uh any kind of pending legal action against the property this is a good thing to know. I've got a client right now, a coaching client, who um, has been in a deal where there was a lawsuit or a lien against the property and nobody was aware of it except for the seller who didn't tell anybody. So it's not a bad idea to go ahead and see if there's any kind of pending legal action against the property. You're also going to want to know if the property is subject to an HOA. This is really important because it really can affect what your client can afford. So if your client says to you, 
I would love to look at a house where I'm not spending more than $1,000 a month. Well, we've got to think about not just about that mortgage payment, but what if there's an HOA that's $200 a month? That's a, that's a huge difference in what your client can afford. So we need to look at that HOA information, find out whether or not the property is subject to an HOA. And yes, I will, I will send this, guy, this stuff to you guys when we're finished. What we'll do is in order to get your contact information, go over one more time in the chat box, you'll see my name and email address. Make sure you copy that and just send me a quick email after this that says, hey, I would love to get this information from you. I'm sure Amy's going to uh, like send me, well, I, we've got people from all over, so that's probably the best way to do it is just go ahead and copy my email address so I can send this to you later. Okay, so HOA, another big one, especially those of you who are in the Louisville area, this one is huge determine whether or not the property is in a floodplain. We can look at the MLS all day long, but you're assuming that the list agent has put that information in correctly just by reading the MLS. So we want to go ahead and we want to do our due diligence and find out whether or not the property is in a floodplain. I am speaking from experience when I tell you you want to do that because that's the only time I've gotten in trouble is by not looking at that. So you can go to uh, a couple of places. If you're in Louisville, you're really lucky because you can go straight to MSD and MSD will give you that information. Uh, anywhere else, you guys can go to FEMA, plug in the address and it will tell you, it'll give you a report as to whether or not the property is in a floodplain. And that can really affect things too, as far as a bottom line. It's not just about whether or not you're worried about the house getting water. The very edge of the house could be the only place that's in the floodplain, which means the entire house has to have flood coverage. That can be very expensive. So again, we're trying to make sure that this is making sense for our clients. So you've done all this, you've gotten all the information, it's checking all the boxes, and you guys have said, yep, we're still gonna move forward, we're gonna write an offer. So now that we've gathered that information, what we need to do is contact the list agent. Do not miss this step. Don't miss this step. Contact the list agent. I promise you creating a relationship with the cross sale agent with the list agent is one of the best things you can do for your client. I have literally had agents accept offers from me because of the relationship I've created with them. They've gone to their clients and said, this agent has worked really hard to make sure that I'm getting all of the information to her, that I'm asking you all of these questions. She seems like somebody we would want to work with. I've said it to my, my sellers before. It does make a difference contacting that list agent. So put a smile on your face, call the list agent, and get some information. What can we ask? Well, let's ask if the property is still available for sale. In this market, it's a legitimate question, asking whether or not it's still available. Um, does the property qualify for FHA or VA loan? A list agent typically will know this. Um, I know that if I list a property and I see chipped paint all over the place, that's going to be an issue. Um, those kind of things are, are going to stand out a little more for that list agent than it possibly for you as the buyer's agent. So go ahead and ask that list agent whether or not they think it's going to qualify for FHA or VA or USDA, um, and they may not know, but it's a good question to ask. Uh, of course, if you have a conventional loan, you may not want to, you don't have to ask this, or if you have a cash buyer. Um, ask the list agent if he or she is expecting any other offers. Great question to know. Um, ask the seller, ask if the seller is going to request highest and best if there is a multiple offer situation. Everyone does this differently. Even though you're asking the list agent if the seller is going to request highest and best doesn't mean that they will. There are times where they say, yes, we're going to do that. We're going to allow these multiple offers. And there are times where the seller is going to say, nope, I've changed my mind. I'm taking offer number two. Let's just go. So it can happen, but you want to ask. And by asking that, you're already letting that list agent know that the expectation is please be honest with me. I need to know this information for my client. So ask if they're going to get any more offers. Let the agent know that you are submitting an offer. 
Um, I've heard agents in the past say, I think that that shows my hand. I shouldn't tell them that I'm writing an offer because they might go get other offers. Well, you know, that's 2002. That's not the way it is now. In this market, we need to make sure that that agent knows that we're writing an offer because other people probably are too. I have a quick uh, question when you reach out to the listing agent uh -huh. and if they ask what, what's your client's budget? Mm. Are, yeah, aren't, are you give, you're giving way too much information if you say that because then you're losing out a negotiation, yeah. right? Yeah, that's a list agent pumping you as an agent to see if you're going to give them more information than you should. Okay, it's got a it. Great tactic. I do it myself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just to see if somebody's going to tell me. Okay, got it. Okay. Yep. Don't, don't share that info. Good question. Um. Okay, so we're going to let them know we're submitting an offer. And then this is what I was talking about before, establishing that rapport with the agent. Very, very important. Ask them what's important for the seller. It matters. There are times where the purchase price is not the most important thing to a seller. We've all been there. And, and I know that there have been times where I've sold houses and it hasn't necessarily been about the bottom line. So... Ask what's important to the seller and learn everything you can about the property. If Annie is the list agent, I might say to her, hey, Annie, I love all the information you've provided on the MLS. Thank you so much for the detail. Is there anything you can think of that you or your seller may have left out? Anything that you may think that maybe isn't that important, but I don't know about. I would love to hear it. So just ask, is there anything else that I like that I need to know about the property? Also, find out if any offers have been terminated and find out why. That goes back to the fallout or somebody changing their mind or maybe not having financing, but you're gonna to wanna to see whether or not there have been other offers. So when we're asking this agent all the information we can about their seller and the property, here are some of the things that might be important to the seller. So as a seller, what could be important to you? The closing date. I may not, I may be taking a new job in a new town and it doesn't start for 60 days. Perhaps I don't want a 30 day closing. So closing date could be very important. Purchase price, of course, might be very important. Possession timeline. So that goes right hand in hand with closing date. So your, your possession timeline when you close a deal, you can get keys at the closing table and your client takes possession immediately at closing. Or you could have a delayed possession. You could also have an early possession, but that's another topic. But you could have a delayed possession. Actually, either one of these could be important. Um, but for the early possession, that's typically more for the buyer side. On the seller side, perhaps a delayed possession is important. Have you guys? Heard, is everybody familiar with, with delayed possession? That came up in the workshop a little bit. And I'm curious to know, I guess, how that works. Like, do you want to close and possess on the same day? What, like, what's, I just don't understand that as well. Sure. Okay. Well, okay. So for instance, I had a client who was purchasing a home in Union, Kentucky. And that seller was purchasing another home in another city. Mm -hmm. so there were three, there were two purchases, well, actually three. My client was selling and buying. This person was selling and buying. So we had three houses. Mm -hmm. So the person in the middle was feeling as if they needed a little more time to make sure all these other deals were going to happen. Mm -hmm. And they were actually going to need that moving truck on that day to get their stuff out to get to the next place. And mm -hmm. so what they asked for was a little more time. So let's make sure we close on Monday. And once we all feel good that we've closed, now I'm going to be out of the house by Wednesday. That gives me time to pack it, make sure everything's packed up and I'm out of here. So there could be multiple reasons why you want a delayed possession, but it's usually because the seller is either going somewhere else and they can't get there right away, or they're just requesting a little more time to get out. Is there ever a situation where the delayed possession is 
you know, longer than just a couple days and the buyers request that they, I don't know, pay rent or I don't like, does that happen? Yeah, there are some areas in our country where the delayed possession is expected. I've seen delayed possessions up to 30 days. Okay. It was insane in our area because in our area, we don't do that. Right. But yes, you can have a delayed possession for a week, two weeks, 30 days. And typically, if it does go past a couple of days, there is a rent, a rent back. That is okay. Insecure. Okay. Got it. Cool. And, and each one of you guys, if I'm assuming that everybody's either Cincinnati market or Louisville market, no matter where you are, your MLS likely has a delayed possession agreement that you have that you could put together. If you do not have that, or if you're wondering if you do, that's another question that you can ask of me and I will direct you to that. So typically the delayed possession agreement, here's something to think about with the delayed possession agreement. So seller owns the house, goes to closing, closes on the house. Now buyer owns the house, right? So buyer is allowing seller to stay there for a few days. So there are times where I've seen agents require that seller get renter's insurance for their belongings because remember they no longer own that home the buyer does and so that buyer's insurance may cover their personal items but just to be safe if something were to happen the seller may be requested well former seller but the seller no longer the owner may be required to carry uh, renter's insurance what I would do is make sure that you have had your delayed possession reviewed by an attorney to make sure that it is the best thing um, available for your client and your client's interests. Would you do another walkthrough then too, if it was a delayed possession? Because usually you do that walkthrough before closing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in your delayed possession agreement, it should state that another walkthrough will be needed. So when that happens in, in so for instance, that example I just gave you of my client buying in Union, we did a walkthrough before closing and then we did a walkthrough before they moved in. And I even did a bit of a recording when we did the walkthrough and said to my clients, we are walking through, we have, do not have possession, we're walking through and we walked through and we walked out. And so I had a record of the fact that we went in without any things and saw the house and we were okay with the walkthrough. Make sense? Okay, fantastic. Okay, so uh, possession timeline. We were talking about what might be important to the seller. Possession timeline. Um, personal items. Perhaps there's a chandelier that's in the dining room that was grandma's and they forgot to omit that from the, the MLS and it was still hanging. That might be something that's really, really important to them and they would like to take with them. So personal items could be something that, that's important. Um, repairs. You might be writing an offer on a house that's in really good shape and um, they'd like to sell it as is. So don't come at me with a GFCI outlet because <laughs> that's not gonna fly. So that might be important to the seller. And um, motivation, flexibility, um, I have had an agent on our team recently write in her offer that they were going to close on a certain date and then other provisions wrote buyer can be as flexible as needed on the closing date. So that flexibility might be important to a seller. You have no idea until you ask. The point is, is to ask as many questions as possible of that list agent with a smile on your face while you're doing it. Any questions around that, about what could be important to a seller? All right, fantastic. We're going to move forward. Okay, so we've obtained all of that information, and now you're going to make sure that you get the things from the MLS that you need as well. So you want to have that property condition report, seller's disclosure. Um, if the seller's disclosure or property condition report, I'm saying it two different ways because it's called two different things in two different markets. Um, if it's not available, you want to get that from the list agent. That needs to be something that is provided to your buyer. Um, and both of those contracts, whether you're in Ohio or you're in Kentucky, have a, a space that says, I have not received the seller's disclosure and they have a timeline to get it to you. So 
uh, property condition report, lead-based paint disclosure, um, if they have a plat or a floor plan or a floodplain report, any of those things that are in the MLS, you're wanting to gather all of that information for your client, for your client to review. I even go ahead and have my client initial everything. So if I'm looking at a listing on the MLS and the list agent has provided a plat, a floodplain, a uh, what else? A floor plan, anything, um, recent upgrades, a list of things. I go ahead and I have my buyer initial off on each one of those pages to show that they've seen that. That's just good practice. So have your buyer sign or initial any of those and then save those into command if you're um, Keller Williams. If you're not, you can save it in dot leap or DocuSign. Um, if the property is subject to an HOA, get those bylaws, the rules and regulations, your master deed and insurance. Um, a lot of times you can contact the HOA um, manager. Um, these property management companies are able to provide this information to you. Oftentimes you can just get on their website, throw in a credit card number and get all that information. And there are also times where they make a lot of this stuff public and you don't have to pay for anything. So go check out the uh, neighborhood's website and you might find all the recent rules and regulations there. Um, when your client is writing that earnest money deposit, there are several ways where they can get that to your market center. There are market centers that allow you to wire the funds. I know we do that in Cincinnati. Um, there's also an app that can be used where your client can uh, send their earnest money. I think there's a $15 charge to your clients for that. Um, if they are sending by mail, going old school and writing a check or dropping it off, you're going to ask your client to take a picture of that earnest money check, have the earnest money made out to the market center and put on the memo line the address of the property that, they're, that you're writing the offer on and make sure that you get a copy of that and then save that for your records. This is, a, this is an interesting one. <laughs> have your uh, buyer write a letter to the seller. Now, somebody in, <laughs> might not be very happy with me for saying this. Try to remove yourself from this one. And if your buyer would like to reach out to the seller and say, hey, I am the buyer and I love your house, the best way to do this is to have the buyer drop off or send a letter directly to the seller and you have nothing to do with it. If you would like to have something to do with it, then that's up to you. I am not telling you to do it. I'm just suggesting that there are agents who do. And so you may want to consider having your buyer write a letter to the seller. Um, and hypothetically, they could even include a picture if they wanted to. Um, I've seen it work both ways. I've seen in different markets where it is frowned upon. I've seen it in markets where it's expected. So know your market and whether or not that's something that you feel comfortable doing. Um, I personally would suggest that if your buyer wanted to get that information to a seller, they do that on their own and leave you out of it. Um, if your buyer is getting, do you guys know why I'm saying it like that? Seems like any number of things could go wrong in a seller letter uh, to the buyer, even including fair housing issues, right? You nailed it, fair housing. It's all about fair housing. So yeah, that's it. So you've got to be careful. Then you've got to, if you're, if you're instructing your client to write a letter, then you need to be, you better be instructing your client on how not to violate fair housing laws and rules. So yes, thank you, Wes. Um, if your buyer is getting a VA loan, the buyer cannot pay for the termite inspection. This is something you guys need to know when writing offers. If you have a VA buyer, they cannot pay for it. VA doesn't care who pays for it. You can pay for it. The list agent can pay for it. The seller can pay for it. It doesn't matter. The guy across the street can pay for it as long as the buyer does not pay for it. That's typically going to be anywhere from 75 to 100 bucks, but you cannot expect the buyer to pay for that. Um, I have in here asked the seller to pay for that up to $100. Um, 
in a competitive market, you may not even want the seller to pay the hundred dollars. You may say, I'll pay for it. And so consider that if you're, if you're um, trying to be as competitive as possible when you're writing that offer. When you guys are writing an offer, make sure you allow seven to 10 days for your inspection timeline. Um, not too long ago, we were putting anywhere up to 14 days. That is too long in today's market. We don't have time for that. So you're gonna wanna ask for seven to 10 days for your um, home inspection. And then provide two to three days for your response time. This is a great opportunity to consider purchasing as is. I know we've talked about it a little bit already, but when we're talking about that home inspection, you can request the home inspection and then in special provisions state that the buyer is agree agreeing to purchase the home as is. And um, doesn't mean they don't get the inspection. You still get the inspection. It's just that no matter what comes out of that inspection, you're not going to be asking for repairs. You're either going to move forward with the purchase back out of the deal. Those are your only two options. Um, to know this is, this is what you tell your clients. This is what, even if you're on the list side, this is a good thing to remind your sellers is that the buyer picks the closing date. The seller does not. Now it has to be, it has to work for both parties, no doubt, but the buyer picks the closing date. So what I would recommend, and if I bet if you've contacted any of your lender friends or your closing attorneys, your title companies, they are going to agree with me on this. Do not ask to close at the end of the month. Do not ask to close on a Friday. Why am I saying that? Because things go wrong all the time. You can't fix it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's say you're closing on, on Friday at three o'clock and something goes wrong. What happens? I'm not sure. Your client has to wait till Monday, at least. So now we've got days that they've got to wait. So let's just say you're closing on Wednesday at three and something goes wrong. You've got two solid days during the week to figure that out, to solve the problem, whatever it is, right? So there's not as much of a delay if you're not closing on a Friday. And then the end of the month is just the fact that the title companies and the lenders are swamped into the month because every realtor in the entire world asks to close at the end of the month and it's not the best time. So if you can go smack dab in the middle of the month, in the middle of the week, that is the absolute best thing you can do for your client. So keep that in mind when you're writing your offer. Um, I, this is again what I said earlier, remember to ask the lender if your buyer needs closing costs that are paid by the seller. Um, in a competitive market or multiple offer situation, be prepared to use an escalation clause and you might want to consider an appraisal contingency. So let's talk about that escalation clause first. Are you guys all familiar with escalation clauses? Okay, fantastic, a few of you are. So the escalation clause, let's show you what an escalation clause looks like. So this has a few clauses. What I want you to do is look at the very bottom one. So this one. So here is an example of an escalation clause. This says in paragraph two, because this was written when I was helping somebody with a Louisville contract. Um, I assume the, I haven't looked over at it, but I assume the GLAR contract is still paragraph two. Anyway, uh, you'll write that your client is offering 274,000. Let's say that is your lowest offer. That's what your client would like to purchase the home for, 274. And then in your other provisions, you are going to write, in the event seller receives an offer, for more than 274,000 net of seller paying closing costs and prepaids, buyer agrees to pay 1,000 above this offer, not to exceed 279,000 or whatever amount they've agreed to pay. Upon seller's acceptance of this contract, the final sales price will be 174,000 or $1,000 more than the other offer but not to exceed 279. 
seller shall provide a copy of any other offer if such offer was utilized to increase the purchase price of this contract. A lot of stuff in there. So the idea behind the escalation clause is this. We have no idea what everyone's offering in a multiple offer situation. We just know that there are multiple offers out there. Let's say the property is listed for 250 and your client feels really comfortable offering 255. It's a seller's market. It's okay to go a little bit over. It'll likely appraise and there are multiple offers. So maybe your client feels comfortable going at 255. Caution, you must check the comps. Are the comps going to be able to support the 255 that your client is willing to pay? So let's say your client's willing to pay 255 and that's the absolute max they're willing to go. So you may say to your client, you know what, let's come in at 250 and put an escalation clause up to 255. So that way, if somebody comes in at 251, we might beat them. So you'll say, we're going to offer 250. If another offer comes in higher than ours, we're, we're willing to beat that offer by $1,000 up to 255, which is what your clients told you. In this instance, we were going to offer 254 and the clients were willing to go up to 274 and the clients were willing to go up to 279. You're going to see that number be a lot larger, that gap. There are going to be times where you're coming in at 250 and your client says, you know what, I'm willing to pay 275. I need to have this house. This is mine. Well, that's fantastic that your client wants it and they're willing to pay 275, but is it going to appraise? Because then you have a whole new set of issues when the property doesn't appraise for 275. Make sense? So when you're going into writing an escalation clause, don't just do it willy nilly, do your homework. See whether or not you think the comps support your escalated value. And if it doesn't, you may want to consider an appraisal contingency. But let's talk a little bit more about this uh, escalation clause before we move forward on the appraisal contingency. One thing I want to say about the escalation clause is, and you guys have to figure this out for your own business, but for my business, if I'm writing an offer less than 200,000, I recommend my clients only give $500 over the top offer instead of a thousand right around 200 to 500, I say $1,000. But when I start going over that $500,000 mark, I'm asking my clients to write three and $5,000 to beat the top. It's just a different, it's each stage is a little different. So under 200, I'm going 500, 200 to 500, I'm going 1,000, 500,000 and up, I'm going anywhere from three to $5,000 in my escalation. Make sense? Okay, fantastic. I will send all of this to you guys too. So if there's something on here um, that you wanted to copy, just know that I will send this to you. And disclaimer guys, anything I'm telling you, I am not an attorney and I'm not your broker. So you may wanna make sure that your broker is happy with any of this information that I'm sharing with you today. I've had my broker check it and I've had other brokers look at it, but you want to make sure that your broker's happy, okay? Okay, so that was our escalation clause. So what we're finding sometimes or oftentimes when we're writing these offers and there are multiple offers coming in and we have these escalation clauses that sometimes the properties don't appraise. I'm going to give you a little side note. If you are a list agent, actually, doesn't even matter if you're a list agent or a buyer's agent. As a list agent, if you have multiple offers on a property you have listed, it is absolutely imperative that you take a copy of those offers and put them inside the house before appraisal. That appraiser is going to go through you to schedule that appraisal, right? It does make a difference. I have asked multiple appraisers about this. 
if they see that they are walking into a house that's listed at 250 and the contract in front of them says they're buying it for 275 and they see multiple offers sitting there on the counter all above 250 it does make a difference when they are thinking about their valuation so as a list agent to help make sure that everybody understands how attractive this property was and how many people were willing to go over list have those offers ready for the appraiser to see flip side and i did this last week and i am guilty of it flip side when you are the buyer's agent there is absolutely nothing wrong with you saying to that list agent once you've won the deal and i didn't do this last week and i wish i had say to that list agent hey i'm so excited that appraisal has been scheduled for tuesday i assume that you are going to provide the appraiser with the multiple offers you received yes you're kind of doing their job and it's the best way to protect your client i assume you're going to share those with the appraiser you want to make sure that appraiser is aware that this property was so hot that multiple people came in and they were ready to offer over list. Okay, off my soapbox on that one. Okay, so we've written an offer. We've decided that we're gonna throw an escalation clause in there because our client really wants this property. Here's a couple of examples of an appraisal contingency. Again, please have your broker review this to see if they like it. There are two. So, Appraisal contingency. Buyers offer to pay up to $5,000 cash to sellers at closing in the event that the property does not appraise for the agreed upon purchase of $249. Buyer will provide up to $5,000 to cover the difference between the appraised value and the purchase price of $249. Total paid by buyer shall not exceed the $249. That's one way to do it. Another way, if you're really worried that it might not appraise, is get the buyer and the seller to agree to split the difference or split the, split the appraisal difference. So the next one brings that up. Buyers shall pay up to $5,000 cash to sellers at closing in the event that the property does not appraise for the agreed upon purchase price of $249. Buyer will provide up to $5,000 to cover the difference between the appraised value and purchase price of $249. If the difference between the appraised value and the agreed upon purchase price is greater than 5,000, seller agrees to pay the remainder of the difference. And then I threw out there not to exceed 5,000 because quite honestly, if the property is not appraising for, if it's appraising less than $10,000 of the agreed upon purchase price, parties might need to reconsider whether or not they wanna move forward on this house. So here we have an example of the buyer paying half and the seller paying half in order to get the deal done. Make sense? Has anybody used an appraisal contingency? No, I haven't. Hey, Teresa. Hi, I do have a question about the appraisal though. Mm -hmm. uh, my sell well can the buyer's agent send comps to the appraiser before they appraise no because we don't know who the appraiser is oh okay gotcha yeah we're completely out of the loop when it comes to the appraiser because they're contacting the list agent so we know nothing okay thank you yeah you can provide those comps because if the appraisal comes back and you're going to contest that appraised value, mm -hmm. definitely. And I have had appraisers contact me as a list agent and say, you know what, I'm having, which I wish every appraiser would do this. Um, I'm having a tough time, Kristen, finding the value on your listing. What comps did you use? I've had appraisers ask that before, but I've never, as a buyer's agent, been able to be, we're not supposed to be in contact with the appraiser. And neither is the lender. The lender is not supposed to be either. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Fantastic. We're going to jump in. Oh, you guys will get this too. That's just one of those things where when I'm doing my um, repair request, I ask for... Um, 
Well, here it is. Any repairs must be completed in good and workmanlike manner by a licensed, if applicable, party that will agree in writing that the buyer is a third party beneficiary to the contract between said party and the seller. Said writing shall be provided to the buyer three days before closing. Basically, it's when somebody does work on the listing and your buyer's name is included in the work because once your buyer owns that property, your client is going to want to have their name on any of those invoices because now they're the owner of the home. So that's what that is. I just had uh, several clauses in there. Okay, so let's dig in a little bit more. So we've got an idea of exactly what we need to do to prepare for writing an offer. Who wants to write an offer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do it. Okay. Do you guys ever have trouble with this bar in Zoom that drops down so far that it gets in your way and you can't get to your stuff? That's me. Okay, so we are going to be writing some offers together. Hold on, I've got a chat on here. Let me make sure it's not something that I need to jump over. I get close to it. Oh, where should it go? Okay. So we've gone through the steps of what to do. Now, get ready to actually write an offer. So does everybody have access to a purchase contract? If you are uh, Keller Williams, you're going to have that in command. You have that in dot loop. You have that in the MLS transaction desk. If you are Louisville transaction desk, if you are Northern Kentucky, does everybody have access to a blank purchase contract? Fantastic. Everybody's got that. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to write an offer. Here are your offer writing rules. If they show up. Mm. Okay, so for this offer writing workshop, and you guys, we have, we've got 40 minutes almost. So for your offer writing workshop, you're going to need to have your offer ready to review. Don't worry if this is your first time or your 100th time of writing an offer. We're not looking for perfection. We're going to learn from one another. So you represent the buyer. I represent the seller. And this is the information my seller has agreed to share with you. My spouse and I are downsizing and we are under contract to build a home in Wyoming. Our close date is supposed to be the first week in April. However, we would love some time to move our things out. We have a ton of personal items after all these years. We raised our kids here, so we want a family who will love it as much as we do. We're hosting an open house this Sunday, two to four. Price, delayed possession, and someone who will love our house will be important to us. You're going to be offering your, uh, you're going to be submitting your offer today. For the Louisville agents, your address is 1221 Ormsby Lane. This is your listing that you will be writing on. Cute little house. Active today, 214.9. And if you're writing in Cincinnati, I love this pink couch. You're writing an offer on 6600 Hitching Post Lane. Now, here's one thing I'm going to say. I know we've only got 30 minutes to put these together. However, you've got my email address. You are more than welcome. If you don't get this offer together completely, you are more than welcome to finish your offer and email it to me and I will review it this weekend for you and give you any tips. So just know that even though we're going to end this session together in about 30 minutes, I will still review your offer over the weekend and give you uh, my feedback if you would like. Okay, so this is what we're, we're writing for in Cincinnati, 6600 Hitching Post Lane. In Louisville, you guys are writing an offer for 1221 Ormsby Lane. So here's some of the rules. Don't ask anybody in your office any help, but you are more than welcome to talk amongst yourselves for any help filling out the offer. Fair enough? You guys are supposed to be excited. You get to write an offer. This is exciting stuff. Are we ready to write an offer? Yes. 
All right, let's start getting busy. I'm going to be here. Yeah. If you have a specific question, I can help out. Teresa, you started to say something, I thought. Nope, okay. I'm gonna put over here the checklist for preparing. So you can see that. I'm gonna go on mute for just a little bit and you guys start working on that offer.
Hey, Stephanie. Yes. Have you used um, Transaction Desk at all? No, I have no idea what that is. Okay, so I'm going to take you through Transaction Desk while everybody's putting their offer together. And you can get an idea of how quickly you can get to the information and write the offer within um, the Louisville MLS, okay? Okay. So if you just watch my screen, I'm going to take you through it, okay? Okay. Okay, so we've, seen, we've got the listing here. You've got Transaction Desk. So I clicked on the listing, on a transaction desk, and then I'm, I'm just gonna start working on it and you can just watch while I'm doing that since everybody else is working on their stuff, okay? Okay. Unfortunately, I went ahead and created one, so I'm going to delete this and start over. Yeah, I just completed my uh, application with GLAR, so I don't necessarily have access to uh, MLS uh, just yet. Okay, okay. Well, um, and they may want you writing your offers completely through command. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times what I do is I'll go through um, Transaction Desk on the MLS, and then I will upload it into command um, in dot loop, um, just because I've been using transaction desk for years and years and I can fly through it real quickly. And I do like the way it populates. Um, it'll take the information from the listing and then populate that into your contract. So this is just one way that you can, you can put the offer together. Hey, Kristen, quick, quick question. Uh -huh. um, so a um, brand new agent got set up. Uh, I'm about three weeks into this. Uh, I just went into command and created a fake opportunity and then founded, found the documents to create the offer. I'm not going to screw anything up if I walk through that and enter it into that. Emma. Okay, good. No, you won't. If you were to use Transaction Desk, you can see where it populates some of this information just from the MLS. You do not need to add anything or delete anything. You're just moving on to the next because really what you're doing here in this section is just going to the forms. You'll notice that it goes ahead and puts Olivia as the listing agent, has me as the selling agent. If you are on a team, you will need to add your co-agent here. This is where you go get your forms. You're getting the residential sales contract.
it goes ahead and takes the other documents that are included in the MLS and adds those. You go and open your form and this is where you start filling stuff out. If you're using transaction desk. I forgot to talk to you guys about earnest money deposit. I typically ask for about 1%. If my clients are writing an offer on a property that's less than 100,000, then I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and do a $500 earnest money. But my rule of thumb is usually uh, close to a 2%. Hey, Kristen. Yes. Um, you typed in uh, 10 days where it says for uh, the buyer uh, um, inspection uh, mm -hmm. within 10 days. So does that mean that after 10 days and the buyer cannot request an inspection or what does, why, why do you put 10 days there? Correct. So your buyer has, in this instance, 10 days to hire a licensed contractor or any other licensed professionals to inspect the property. And within that same time period, you have to get the repair request together if your client is going to request repairs. 
So that's a 10 day window to get the inspectors in and you to review the inspection report with your clients and put together your repair request if you're asking for repairs. Once you have the inspection done, your client gets to decide whether or not they wanna move forward with the, pro the purchase. So this is the, when I go over this part with my clients, I literally say when we get to this paragraph on inspections, line mm -hmm. 170, this is the most important part of the contract. Most important because it's the only place where I can legally get you out of this deal if you were ever wanting to get out of it. Okay. And it's the ultimate protection for you as a buyer to make sure you are purchasing a home that you're going to be happy with. So this is very important. So I'm allowing, we're asking the seller to allow us 10 days to get in there with our licensed inspectors, mm -hmm. get the property, and then get our repair request together. And like I said, we can either move forward with the purchase of the property as is, so mm -hmm. not asking for repairs, we can move forward with the purchase of the property and ask for repairs, or we can decide to back out of the deal and terminate the contract. Okay. And then these other t numbers down here, these are the other timelines. So the seller has two days to respond to us. So once we've submitted that repair request to the list agent, they now have two days to respond to our request. Okay. And then we have two days to review their response and decide how we want to respond. And then the last one is when you guys are at the point with the counter offering and you're indicating this is the last best and final response. If the parties do not agree to the terms with the, that back and forth within two days, then the contract is null and void. Okay. These timelines, honestly, guys, when there are issues with agents, you know, dropping the ball, it's typically because of these timelines. Here's a helpful hint for you guys. If you want to take just a second to listen to this one, this is kind of just years of experience. When I have my clients writing an offer and we've written that we're going to get a home inspection done in 10 days, I put together, I'll show you what I put together. I have an email that is a canned response or uh, a template that I use. I'm sure it's still the one that just sent. And in that will be a checklist of what to expect next. If you're on a team, your team probably has that too. And so I will send a congratulations, you're under contract. Here are the things that you need to keep in mind that are happening next. And I thought I had it right there on the left. Okay, hold on. <clears throat> so this is an example of that email that I send out that says, congratulations, you're under contract. And in here, it says, step two, call a home inspector and see if they can inspect the house. Well, if I've just put them under contract and I have a 10-day window for them to get the inspection, I will literally say nine days. Oh. Even though I've given it 10 days, I always back up one day when I'm telling my clients how quickly they need to get this stuff together. And the only reason I do that is because you will have clients who drag their feet and wait to the last second. And that makes it very difficult for you to represent them the best of your ability. So I just kind of fudge it a little bit. And instead of 10 days, I will tell my clients they have nine days. Okay. Just a good thing to get in the habit of, I think. Thank you for those questions.
Don't forget that I told you that the seller is downsizing and they're buying a new construction that's supposedly ready the first week in April. And they've already asked if they could have a little time to get out. They've said that price, delayed possession, and someone who will love our house will be very important to us. Kristen, I'm going to have to drop off to get to a meeting. I'm, I'm too late. Um, I'm still fighting through this on command. So um, I'm, I'm going to finish this up this afternoon when I get back. Thank you. Fantastic. If you want to send it to me, feel free. Okay. okay. Have a good one. Thank you. So we've got about 10 minutes before this ends. So if you don't mind, I would love to hear from you. Has this um, workshop been helpful for you? Yes, very helpful. And going through it the second time was even more helpful. Oh, good, good, fantastic. Yeah, I came in late, so I will probably definitely be um, watching for your next workshop for sure. Okay, fantastic. What's going to be really fun, Stephanie, is when we can do this all in the room together where I can actually be in your market center and we can, we can do these workshops together. Because we'll definitely do that. Does anybody feel confident enough, like where you are right now? Would anybody like to share what they've put together so far? Didn't give you a whole lot of time to actually write the offer. I wish we had more time together. We could keep this going, <laughs> but it's Friday <laughs> afternoon. I want to respect your time. I think the next one we can do too is going to concentrate on um, the angle from the the list agent too on how to how to negotiate multiple offers and how to handle that for your your clients. Would you guys find that interesting? Yes, I would. Okay, we'll put together a best practices when navigating multiple offers for your seller. I think that would be a very valuable class. And I'd like to do, do more things with our two market centers. So you guys have opportunities to meet agents and other, other market centers that are close to you for referral opportunities, for sure. So I'll work on that. All right, guys, well, I'm going to offer up the next five, six, seven minutes of our time together and see if I can answer any of your questions that you still may have. Do you have any questions around what we've been working on today? I've answered everything. You guys have nothing? This is fantastic. <laughs> I have a question, and I might need to connect with you after this on it, but have you ever been in a situation where a client has a special type of loan where they don't have to put anything down? And so how would, so if they're not putting anything down, then they wouldn't have any earnest money, I guess. If they're putting 0% down. 
you're still going to have the earnest money. So the earnest money is another way of saying good faith deposit. And the okay. reason why you had a good faith deposit is to explain to your, your seller, to the seller, that you are acting in good faith. I really do want to buy this house and I want it so bad that I am willing to let you hold on to this $2,000 check. And if I just change my mind tomorrow, you get to keep it. So that earnest money has nothing to do with um, the loan terms. That is just a way for your buyer to say, I'm acting in good faith and here's a deposit to that you can keep should I stop acting in good faith. Does that make sense? Yes. So then if they're not, if they're putting 0% down and they, but they do earnest money, then do they just get the earnest money back once they go through the transaction? Sure. So the earnest money, there are a few things they can do with that earnest money. There are times where you can go to closing and they actually have a check that they write back to your client. Got there it. Are other times where it's uh, credited to the loan. So it just depends, but they, the buyer will get it back one way or another. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what I often say, my script for that, because I don't know exactly how the lender is working that out with them, is I will say, you are writing an earnest money deposit of $2,000. That's your good faith check. What good faith means is that you are acting in good faith as a buyer and you're not going to just change your mind willy nilly on buying this house. And if you do, the seller gets to keep it. Now, just rest assured, Annie, that this good faith deposit is going to be credited back to you at closing. And so that's how I use it. That's how I say it. Got it. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? None? Hey, Debbie. Well, you guys, this has been fan fantastic. I really appreciated being able to hang out with you guys this afternoon. And I'm going to let you guys go a full four minutes early so you can go enjoy your Friday afternoon. And again, if you want me to take a look at these offers over the weekend, please feel free to reach out to me. You can send those to me. I've sent my, uh, I've shared my email address on the chat and uh, I'd love to hear from you. So thank you so much. You guys have a good one. Thank you. See everybody.